All right. Thanks so much to our colleagues for joining us for that um, little segment. Get us warmed up here. It's time for our questions. I'm going to introduce you to Chris Hutchinson, who is joining us this morning um, to offer us our questions. He's going to live review the questions that are that you've been submitting, and um, he'll ask us a question, and then one of us will have an answer. <laughs> So we're going to start. <laughs> I don't know which way to go. That way. No, that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to start with throwing up a, um, a timer. And we're going to do 12 minutes for each of these sections. So 12 minutes will go fast. We're going to try to get through as many as we can. Um, I know there's a lot of one of our, our favorite things about the tool we're using this year is you can see everybody else's questions because we're always overwhelmed with how awesome your questions are. So you guys can take a look and see and be inspired as we often are by the questions you bring. Um, we obviously won't be able to get through all of them, but we'll try to get through as many as we can. Okay, I think with that, Chris, what do you got? All first right. Question. Well, the first two questions are tightly interlinked. So I'm gonna ask both of them. I'm struggling to balance my commitment to the inherent worth and dignity of all people with the fact that a large segment of our population seems unwilling to vaccinate or mask to protect others. Help. And the second question, I have lost compassion and developed intense impatience for anti-vaxxers and for organizations like Fox News that purposely spread lies and misinformation. What to do? Well, I have a real simple response to the first question, which is that, oh, it's just me, folks. Um, I think feeling um, angry and disappointed with someone's behavior doesn't have an impact on their inherent worth and dignity. And I think that's the deep, deep challenge of that first principle of ours. And I think it only becomes even more challenging and more robust when paired with our seventh principle that we're all inextricably and fundamentally linked together in this life. So I don't think that respecting somebody's inherent worth and dignity means you need to like them or res even respect their behaviors and choices but it means they're still seen as a person with full humanity, just like you and me. Can I just jump on? I have, there was one part of that that really stood out to me in one of the questions. Um, I, um, I, one of the, the, the components there was about Fox News and the people spreading the misinformation. And I just wanted to name that, like, I, it's that, we need not ask the Supreme Court that um, organizations do, need not be given the same concept of inherent worth and dignity as we offer individuals. Mm -hmm. And so we can find an organization that is systemically um, working against life and enabling others, encouraging others to work against life. We can find it reprehensible and without worth. It has that is that is not about somebody's individual worth, and so I just want to distinguish between it is it is often um, important to name the ways that systems and organizations do not have dignity and do not have worth. That's the only thing I want to add is that you should do it. Um, you should not think that you have to see someone's inherent worth that offering compassion should be a, a selfish choice, I think, because in doing so, in, in living in a compassionate way, you experience, a, you live a better life. And so the, the question that I would have is like, how do you need to tend to the harm that you've experienced because of other people's actions so that you can then come and experience that compassion again? And so I would say, don't turn to those other people, those systems that are that are destructive right now, 
if you're having a hard time finding that compassion, turn turn inward and see how you need to tend to what is causing that that rift in your kind of soul and your capacity. I really appreciate you all answering the sort of combo question there because it definitely is a theme throughout what we're going to be talking about. To shift gears, the next question is now that we have adopted the eighth principle, what actions can we take to make our promise real in our congregation? I'll go. So um, the thing that I think is most important right now is that we think about the question of accountability that the eighth principle invites us towards. So um, which I, I, I think we explored losing track of Sundays, but it might have been last Sunday. Um, so that this that we think more deeply about who we need to be um, in relationships of accountability with and with whom, um, so that um, we can think more uh, particularly about that question that it poses of living in accountable relationships on behalf of beloved community. And I think it's something that we haven't um, we haven't always managed to ground ourselves in. So um, having some of the questions we started last Sunday of um, to whom are we accountable and really particularly in our in our local community, to whom are we as Foothills accountable? Fun one, really. Why are you used generally so shy about telling anyone about our religion? How can we embrace what is this awesome faith community and be okay with evangelizing a religion that could change the world? I can take a stab at this. I think that there's, you know, we put such a, um, a priority in our faith on uh, choice and freedom, right? We, we want a faith that is free um, free for us to be honest with our experience, free for us to find our path, our piece of the truth. And so it, it feels counterintuitive to, um, to try to push someone into that kind of freedom because we want them to you know, be following their own path. But I think what we forget is that, that freedom is something that we, we practice together and that um, just because someone has and should have the right to forge their own spiritual journey doesn't mean that they should do it alone or that they wouldn't benefit from being in a community of people like here at Foothills. Um, and I think, we're, so we're cautious of that. We're cautious of the religious trauma that many people um, have gone through. We're still processing our own um, trauma. If you grew up in another faith that, that made an impact on you that wasn't so positive. And so you're, we're hesitant, hesitant. Um, to invite people and to proselytize because we know the harms that that can cause. And yet we know the life-saving nature of not only our faith, but having community. And so it's, it's something that I hope we can grow on together. I mean, the only reason that I am in this faith and in, in my call in my ministry is because Gabby in 10th grade invited me to youth group. I mean, that's the only reason I'm here is because someone invited me. And 90% of Americans say that they would consider accepting an invitation from one of their friends to come to church, right? And so it, there's possibilities out there. We just need to embrace the fact that, um, that it's okay to share what's important to us and that it's okay if someone tries it and doesn't like it, but we should risk that and that we're not infringing upon them, inviting them into a community that, that centers that freedom. I have just one little thing I want to add, which is I think we have to practice talking about who we are and we need to be we we, we need to have the words available um, when someone says, so what is Unitarian Universalism or what is Foothills? What, what do you believe? Or, you know, just have some practice. So I'd say practice with each other and then practice asking people and be OK if they say, like Sean said, if they say no, but that you know, invite somebody and then practice answering their questions. I think part of that practice too, is that since we're a non-credal faith, often the questions people ask to try to figure out who we are, aren't a great fit for Unitarian Universalism. So the question, what do you believe? 
it's a little rough because I think you use are so much about the how, you know, we're come together in covenant with these shared promises. We're always in process together. Um, and so I think leading with that question that elicits a creedal response, uh, that makes it hard. I think we also have a really long name. Sure. Oh, that's awesome. <clears throat> so here's a personal question. Where do you find hope? Um, I just, I, I just read a story this morning, um, kind of talking through like, you know, you can look at the, at the news headlines and, um, and maybe struggle with hope, but the, the, the way to find hope is always um, to go closer in, to look at your your closest circle around you, and to re to stay to make your own headlines. Is what this this person was saying. Um, and so, I, in my life, I always I, I'm always turning towards those closest in. So, um, all of you, this community, I find so much I like shocking levels of generosity and kindness and compassion and struggle with all the the right things those right questions as Sean was saying and I find hope in you know continuing to journey together that that willingness of people to show up and keep keep journeying together I just I mean, add I find hope in witnessing people's resilience. And in particular, I find hope in stories of survivors and how long, uh, you know, across time, human beings have survived so many incredibly oppressive and painful situations. And thinking especially about survivors who've broken cycles, those people who found ways to break cycles of abuse, to break cycles of oppression, I find that um, incredibly powerful. And that's a big part of what brings me back to church because there's no other kind of community I'm a part of where we really talk about the deep pain that we've been through and how we keep going and how we rebuild a life uh, despite what's happened. I don't always, um, I don't always have hope actually. Hope isn't something that I feel is necessary for living a, a meaningful life, nor a life that is striving towards impact um, and to change the course. I think that it, hope is important in, or for many people, hope is important as kind of a deterrent to feeling hopeless or fatalistic or nihilistic. Um, but for me, sometimes hope can lull me into a sense of um, that other people can do it or they don't have a responsibility or that I need to see a way forward for um, for me to be able to take that next step. And so I, I don't always have hope, um, but I do have commitment, um, a personal commitment and, and a collective commitment in the communities I'm a part of um, to figuring out how we take that next step, even if it's all, all for nothing because I know that's the life that I want to live and that it makes my life better and the life of my community better. I love the way that you have in community shared the hot seat and really been supportive of each other in these powerful questions and there will be more. So for now, we're gonna wrap that up and go on to the rest of our service.